Please be advised that this podcast was made for fun and to share the general experiences of two criminal lawyers in Toronto. You must not take anything you hear in this episode as legal advice. Every situation for every person is different, and you should always consult with a lawyer for legal advice specific to you and your circumstances. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the fifth episode now of Justice Redefined. Who would have thought we would have made it this far? I'm surprised myself. And to uh, welcome to our nine listeners. I think that might be a little ambitious. No, that's way too many. <laughs> Maybe my mom, my uncle, my dad. So I'm Sina Shabisteri, partner and criminal defense lawyer at Titan Defense LLP. And I'm Kabir Sharma, also partner, uh, defense lawyer at Titan Defense LLP, where this podcast is meant to explain and inform and advise the general public of criminal law concepts in a kind of a simple way. And this is now the second episode we are uh, taping at the front of the house here, street level. Yeah, at our new location, 778 College Street, we have this beautiful mural of Rosa Parks. I know you can't see the entire thing in the podcast, but you know you should come check it out in person. It's a beautiful art. It's a beautiful office. All right, Kabir. So uh, why don't you first and foremost give us a little rundown of what is a domestic case? So people generally think domestic assault is its own charge. It's actually not. Um, Any charge can become domestic in nature if it involves members who are intimate partners or members of the same household. Um, So typically what happens is you'll get a regular assault that takes place. The police will find out that's between intimate partners, such as boyfriend and girlfriend, boyfriend and boyfriend, girlfriend and girlfriend, or whatever the case may be. And that regular assault gets elevated to a domestic level assault. And what a domestic label does to any other criminal offense is it makes the penalty more severe. So you can have even mischief. For example, you and your girlfriend are fighting, You take your girlfriend's phone, you smash it. That's a mischief charge. That becomes a domestic mischief if it's in the context of two intimate partners. So domestic assault cases and domestic sex assault cases, there can be domestic murder cases too if you murder your partner. All of that has what's called an aggravating effect on the sentence. Elements are a bit different and... um, yeah, it's prosecuted differently by different teams of Crown attorneys. Right. And, uh, yeah. So the bottom line is that there isn't a, a charge particularized as domestic uh, in nature. However, uh, a matter is considered to be domestic when it's obviously a charge is committed in the uh, um, kind of the context of, of uh, domestic. Yeah, because think about it. You can basically have any criminal offense committed in a, in a domestic right. Well, most of them. Almost, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the law says that it should be treated more severely because typically there's a relationship of um, there's trust built between partners. Yep. That's about to breach. And, you know, various other components that are more complicated. But we don't need to have to get that, that being said, though, I think the most common charges in a domestic case are going to be your assault, your criminal harassment and, you know, the various different types of assault, assaultive behavior and uttering threats, et cetera. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, that's absolutely the most common. Those are the the cases that we get most often at least, right? Right. Um, So I think the next thing that we should talk about is how do domestic cases come about? And they're no different really than other cases. Effectively, what happens is that you have the relevant stakeholders in any criminal charge, you've got the accused, you have a complainant, and then you have a victim. Victims could also be complainants, but uh, that's not always the case. So in an, in a scenario where there's a struggle that happens between a husband and a wife or whatever, uh, intimate partners, and an, another individual, a witness, views that and then contacts the police in that context, they become the complainant and the victim is the individual who is alleged to have been victimized at the hands of the other person. And, and they're also the, those people are also witnesses then at the trial too, right? right? So exactly. if you're the person that observes something and reports it to the police, you then have to come to court and describe to the court um, what happened? So, so like any other charge, domestic charges come about with police contact. So either yeah. somebody contacts the police, be that be it the, a victim, a bystander, or uh, 
sometimes the police will have uh, they'll see domestic violence themselves and they can bring charges about in that fashion yeah i think that um you know usually it doesn't really require much right to get you charged with a domestic assault because the police and the crown attorney they have a really strict policy that they have to follow and Anytime somebody calls the police on somebody else and the police show up and they realize it's a d- domestic situation, all they need to hear are like a couple of key words, i.e. this person touched me. Right. The second police hear that, somebody's getting arrested. There's no way around it. And, and in- interestingly enough, I've actually had a couple of cases uh, like this recently. I had uh, one of my previous clients give me a call um, and, you know, saying to me what a, what a stupid night he had, etc. So we've had cases where effectively both partners now get charged. And in this particular incident, what happened was he was at a club with his fiance. They get into an altercation uh, verbally outside the club. Uh, they go home and uh, effectively police are called. They come on scene. They do an interview with both of them. They speak to police, even though they shouldn't have. And they give their version of events and police determine that they had both assaulted one another. And instead of leaving it be, they charged them both with domestic assault. That's brutal. I, I'll, tell you how, <laughs> I'll tell you how little it takes to be charged with a domestic assault. I was representing this really old, nice, sweet man. The guy's probably like 85 years old. He's been married to his wife for like 55 years. They don't like their or he doesn't like their son because his son is like a drug addict. He's trying to get him out of the house. Mom won't agree. And my client and his wife get into an argument and she's like, if you touch me, if you touch me, I'm going to call the police on you. And he's like, yeah. And he touches her like this. And then (laughs) police get called and he gets arrested for domestic assault. Right. And, but they thought there was something wrong with him uh, mentally as well, which is why they they took him in to get him assessed. But nothing at all was wrong with him. He ended up getting the charges withdrawn after being dragged through the system yeah, well, for over a year. It's a total waste of time. And we know we know how, how bad that is to get dragged through the yeah. system. That's more than punishment enough for, for a lot of instances. But I think that raises a good point. Why do you think there is effectively, for a lack of a better word, a zero tolerance policy when it comes to domestic cases? Because... <clears throat> Back in the day, what used to happen is when the police used to attend a domestic situation, um, they would say, sort it out on your own, right? Yeah. And eventually what happens is the assaults keep getting worse and worse and worse. And a lot of times what happens is, normally it's women, they are um, involved in a cycle of domestic abuse that they can't get out of. They're dependent on the person. Uh, financially, maybe for emotional support, maybe because they have children, and they can't get out of the relationship even if they wanted to. Right. So what happens is they get hit, the guy says, sorry, 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 they get back together, and then the assault is worse. Then they get back to again, the assault is worse, and the next thing you know, he's choking her and she's dead. Right. Right. So the police and Crown Attorneys now have a very strict policy where they don't want any chance or basically any blame put on them for ignoring signs even minor signs of uh, domestic issues going on. Right. So that's why they have this policy. It makes sense in principle, but as we'll tell you, practically sometimes it leaves the victim with even um, in a worse situation sometimes than allowing them to make their decision. And, and I guess we'll get into that for uh, sure a, a bit later. For sure. But yeah, man, it's... Um, so let me ask you this, Sina. You know, you always hear um, clients call us and say, they don't even have any evidence against me. There's no pictures. It's only what she said. Can they arrest me based on just what the other person said? Absolutely. The answer to that is 100%. But Not- like, wh- why people don't understand is sometimes no matter how hard I try to explain to my clients that that is true they don't understand it. How would you explain it to someone? Because it's not CSI. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like it's it's very simple. You don't need. Not only do you not need. Uh, evidence above and beyond somebody's testimony to lay charges. You also don't need evidence above and beyond that to convict somebody. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, I was beaten at the hands of my wife or husband or whatever the case may be, other evidence could corroborate what they're saying could be, you know, look, I took a picture of my injury, whatever the case may be. But their word is enough to not only lay the charge, but it's enough to get a conviction out of... uh, the court system and the reason is as follows 
viva voce evidence is what we call in court testimony is more than sufficient to lay a foundation to meet the elements that you need to meet in order to charge or convict someone. And judges, that's what they're there for. Judges will look at a victim, they'll look at their uh, demeanor, they'll see how they're testifying, what they're saying, does it make sense to them? And if it does, they can, they can convict the individual based on nothing other than the person's testimony. However, if, for example, the person says, the wife or the husband says, my wife or husband beat the shit out of me. You know, they took this weapon and just laid into me just a couple hours ago before I called the police. And the police show up and in their reports, lo and behold, don't make a single mention of an injury. Mm -hmm. And the person says, no, I don't need medical attention. They don't go to the doctor. There's nothing else to support a, a, a vicious attack, then obviously their credibility is going to be shot at trial. Yeah, they're either exaggerating or they're lying, right? It's, exactly. Those are the two explanations. Exactly. Right? So the, the short answer is absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Just on somebody's word, the police can and often do lay charges because unfortunately, in, to some extent, for better or for worse, that's the function of the police. They lay charges because they want to avoid liability. Yeah. They don't want to go away from somebody's house that has cried domestic assault and then they leave, something happens, and lo and behold, now they're held responsible. You were here, you could have prevented this, and you didn't do that. Yeah, exactly. And also in their function of laying as many charges as they can and seeing which ones stick. Yeah, and I, I think another overlooked fact is that sometimes there's only two witnesses to a crime. You know, the person who's alleged to have committed it and the person who's the alleged victim. Exactly. Sometimes there is no other evidence. So if, you know, the police and the court needed other evidence in a lot of domestic assault cases, it wouldn't be sufficient. But and, go ahead. And this, for me, it raises actually a very interesting point that a lot of people don't know about, I think. Obviously, uh, in any criminal proceeding, you have what? You have the right to silence, right? Yeah. You, it's up for the crown to prosecute your case and to prove the case against you beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't have to provide your version of events. Mm -hmm. However, as we know, when you have, as you often do in domestic cases, where the truth lies in the mind of the victim and the accused only, and the victim testifies, but the accused does not, the law allows the judge to more readily accept the victim's version of events. Yeah. Uh, because unfortunately, the inference is, well, why didn't you testify? If yeah, the, the, it's they say it's uncontested evidence. Exactly. There's nothing to say otherwise. I mean, listen, as the function of defense lawyers that we have, our job is to cross-examine, um, you know, on behalf of our clients. And let's be honest here. There is a lot of domestic assault that takes place, but there is a lot, a lot of accusations of domestic assault that are also not true, right? Sometimes, unfortunately, people use them as tools to get ahead in family proceedings. Right. They use tools to get them ahead. Um, sometimes they, they hold them hostage to get certain demands out of them, right? And these kind of things happen. So our job is to identify and bring out inconsistencies in their evidence that damage their overall credibility. So your client doesn't always have to testify. For sure. If you're able to, you know, really find significant inconsistencies. And But you know what? Nowadays, man, it's... It's getting more and more the case where, you know, your client has to testify because I, I feel that's the trend. That's the way things are going. It used to be the case. Like I said, in a drug case or in a gun case, I'm not going to get my client to testify. There's no need. Right. Right. But for a, a case where the judge has to decide if a story is true or not and another story is true or not, I think the judge should have to listen to two stories rather than one. Right. right? And, and that's why we often tell our clients – you know, your testimony is, uh, well, our, our, our accused clients, because we also do represent victims of domestic violence. We tell our accused clients that your testimony is a game day decision. Let's see what happens with the testimony of the alleged victim. And then we'll decide at that point whether it's necessary for you to testify or not. And at the end of the day, you, you shouldn't forget that the judge has to believe the victim in order to convict your client. But he only needs to be left with reasonable doubt uh, based on your client's testimony to uh, discharge him. Yeah, so that means even if your judge, even if the judge says, "Mr. Sharma, I think your client is a complete liar," <laughs> you know. However, 
I'm left in a reasonable doubt because there's a small chance that this is true. Right. Your client gets to walk. That's it. And, you know, that's how it's supposed to be applied. Is it always applied like that? Questionable. But, um, yeah, that's basically how it's... And speaking of victims, um, you know, we represent a lot of victims of domestic assault or domestic-related cases at, the, at this office, too. And, you know... It's sad sometimes to see how small of a voice victims have when they're put into the system. Right. Before they're getting uh, assaulted or while they're getting assaulted, everybody listens to them. They're the most important person in the world. But the second they get charged and they, for example, um, need help with childcare, right? Uh, Maybe they need financial support. And maybe they need to communicate with the person that assaulted them, not for the sake of, I, wanna, um, I want this guy to get acquitted, but we are raising a child together, so I need to communicate with him. And oftentimes, these victims of crime will try their hardest to first communicate with um, the other person, their, the uh, alleged um, accused, uh, accused person here. And the accused person can contact them back because it's against their bail conditions. Right. So their bail conditions say, oh, you cannot communicate with this person. If he communicates with his wife or his girlfriend, he can get charged again and he'll go to jail and you have a harder time getting bail the next time. Yeah. So unfortunately, when a a victim is trying to communicate with the crown to have their voice heard, they get ignored. Yeah. Right. And And it's, it's sad. And that's where we come in. And certain, and I'll tell and Sina explain what explain what what we need to do to make sure things are fair in the system once again. So f- first and foremost, what what you're talking about, so the listeners understand, is that whenever an individual is charged with a domestic case, they're released either from the station or sometimes, and more likely, they end up going to the court. They run a bail hearing or they get released on consent. And there's always various conditions that they have to comply with and sign on the dotted line that they're going to comply with that before they're released back. And invariably in domestic situations, what do we have? Don't contact a victim directly or indirectly. Access your child through a mutually agreed upon third party. Do not attend where you know the victim to be. Don't go home where you live with them. Exactly. So what happens is the difficulties that you're talking about, they're real. They're real difficulties. For example, let's say both of you are on the lease. And let's say the accused is the individual who's paying the rent. Now that individual, he or she can't go back home can't go back home because of a condition, a court order condition not to go back home. They need to go and rent another place elsewhere or stay in a hotel if they don't have the opportunity or have any other family members to stay with. And guess what? If they're destitute and the only money that they had was going through toward the rent that they shared with their domestic partner, they're putting that money toward wherever else they have to live now. And their domestic partner who is being protected, quote unquote, by the system, doesn't have a place to live or has to for left alone with the children and an apartment and bills to pay with absolutely nothing right and so what happens unfortunately is that theoretically uh, victims are supposed to have kind of a buffer zone uh, between them and the police and the crown and that's through vwap and vwap stands for i think the victim witness assistance program that's right and so They're supposed to go through VWAP to communicate to the Crown and the police what they want, what they need, what's happening, what are the circumstances, get information back, what's happening with the accused, have they been released from custody, what are their conditions, etc. Unfortunately, much like everything else in the criminal justice system, it's at a snail's pace, it's grossly underfunded, and... In the meantime, they don't have the resources that they need in order to come forward and in order to... Uh, be able to kind of make sure that their rights are protected. And so that's that's where we come in. And that's where we oftentimes uh, represent victims of domestic violence so that we can, number one, make sure that their voice is heard and we take that directly to the crown who is in charge of prosecuting their domestic partner. And more importantly, we make sure that their voice is heard quickly. Exactly. For example, I mean, <clears throat> well, 
I got to tell you this, okay? Oftentimes, when victims or complainants come to me, they come to me and they really want their conditions changed, but they also feel like they no longer wish to proceed with the prosecution. That's another element altogether, right? Um, sometimes, no matter how hard a c complainant or a victim will um, advocate for themselves and to the police and to the Crown, saying, I don't want to proceed with this, yeah. even if they were lying and now they feel bad about it, right. or if they've now decided that they've forgiven the person, they don't agree with the assault, but there are many women, most women in the world, are smart enough and strong enough to be able to protect themselves when they're found in a situation like this. Right. They know they have access to the police, you know, and it, it beca it's a very parental system where I feel like the government or the police or the prosecution feels like they can't take care of themselves. Right. Right. And that really takes away from the entire element of equal participation in the justice system for all parties, even though it shouldn't be for all parties. Obviously, that is it's the person that goes to jail who's the most important in the criminal justice system. But Section 14 of the Victims Bill of Rights which has been enforced for some time, says that victims have the ability to have their input considered by the Crown Attorney. 100. They have that right to do that. It's yep. a law, yep. right? It doesn't say, like you said, how fast, um, which is unfortunate. And then, you know, like, for example, like, let me tell you what, have you been following the Amber Heard and uh, loosely. Johnny, Very loosely. And Johnny Depp <laughs> situation? I mean, that's a situation where I think initially... Everybody was saying Johnny Depp is a liar. He committed these assaults. She's a victim of domestic abuse. This was, was that that's what was in the media. And then the public finally got to see a trial, okay? And yeah. it wasn't a domestic assault trial. It was obviously a civil trial on um based on defamation or whatever it right. was. However, the Johnny Depp's lawyer, I think her name is Camilla Vasquez or something like that, she obviously was a phenomenal cross examiner. But she wasn't really that much better than many other criminal lawyers or lawyers that do this on a regular basis. Right. You know, she just had a lot of evidence to impeach her testimony. Right. You know, and she made Amber Heard look like a liar. The jury agreed. And now look at the public uh, opinion and public consensus. Now she's getting canceled. Right. Imagine all of these other people, you know, in real life who are your friends or people in the news who you hear that are charged with domestic assault and they get canceled but nobody ever hears about what happens on the tail end of things right what if that happens to that person but no one doesn't hear i mean i guess because you know they're not celebrities or anything like that but uh, you know it was a great example to demonstrate you know how a perspective can change once the facts actually come out once they're tested because the whole point of cross-examination is to test the person's evidence they're saying something okay I smell bullshit. I'm going to test it. And sometimes they pass the test and sometimes they fail. You see, the, the difficulty with that, I agree with everything that you've said, but the difficulty with that is that for the lay people, for the, your average person, that requires time and resources, right? You, it takes time for your case to get to trial so you can plead your case and say, this is my version of events or have your lawyer do an effective cross-examination of a lying victim, for example. Yeah. That takes time. And more often than not, like the, the, by a large margin, the vast majority of criminal cases resolve. Yeah. Right? Because they can't sit around with these you know, difficult bail conditions, can't go home, can't see your kids all the time as you want to. People don't want that looming over their head for 18 months. For 18 months. Right. So, right. Especially when people are responding to their emails, right? Like... Exactly. So I think one, one thing I want to ask you is what impact, if any, first and foremost, do criminal, domestic criminal matters run concurrently with family law proceedings? So I, I think that they can run concurrently, i.e. the process can be started. Yep. So you'll start a support motion or custody motion or whatever it may be in, in family court. Yep. And... Those are all started by like an initializing process or whatever. One of the lawyers has to file or one of the parties needs to file paperwork. Mm -hmm. The criminal system, number one, we have time limits. There's a charter right, section 11B, 
that states that every trial, every criminal trial needs to be heard within a reasonable time. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court has decided for most domestic cases, a reasonable time is 18 months. Right. However, there is a clock ticking because everyone knows the criminal process moves really slow. Mm -hmm. So the criminal case will always have priority to move faster than the family case. Okay. Right? Um, oftentimes, people will also want to wait for the conclusion to criminal court proceedings in order to strengthen their family court application. Explain that. Why is that? So, for example, um, if somebody pleads guilty to something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Say they, they pled guilty to pushing their, their girlfriend just because they want things to be over with, which is not the reason why they should be pleading, of course, but that's why a lot of people do. And um, uh, the complainant or the opposing party on the family side can go to family court and say, look, this person actually abused me. Right. It's, they said it to the judge. The yep. judge asked him, did you do this? Yep. And he said yes to the judge. Yeah. Right, you're so, damned if you do, and you're damned yeah. if you don't. And you if you say no, I, that didn't well, happen. Then, then, they're gonna, to the judge. then they're going to say, "Oh, you <laughs> lied to the judge." Right? He asked yeah. you if you did it. You said, "Yeah, you didn't do it." Right? So that's what um, happens most of the time. And the, the flip side is too that a lot of I feel a lot of family court affidavits are really embellished. Right. I feel like family lawyers really like to embellish like what's happened, include all these crazy things because their clients normally don't get cross examined on their affidavits. Right. So they're actually a gold mine in criminal law. So if there's a family court proceeding going on between you and your husband or wife or whatever, and then you get your hands on those family court document documents, they, and they provided a statement to the police for the criminal case, they have to reconcile a bunch of different statements. And a lot, very few people have the ability to remain consistent between all of that, unless they're entirely true. Mm -hmm. And a lot of lawyers like to coach. A lot of police like to coach. And so sometimes when someone's sitting in the hot box and they start to sweat, right, they can't keep up with their lies. And then, you know, Bob's your uncle. So there, there is definitely an impact on, on criminal proceedings Huge. Uh, yeah. when there is a concurrent uh, family law proceeding uh, going on. What I want to talk about now is that I want to discuss this issue of uh, victim hesitancy to come forward. And as you discussed, you said back in the day, this is the way it was. And uh, to some degree, I think that maybe the pendulum has swung the other way, but we're kind of seeing the middle ground now. And there was a recent case in uh, the Supreme Court called Stairs. Now, that case wasn't specifically about domestic violence. The, what came of that case and the reason why it went to the Supreme Court was what police powers uh, exist yeah. for a search of a dwelling or search of a house subsequent to a, a lawful arrest, okay? But the facts of that case were that um, Mr. Stairs is seen in a motor vehicle with uh, an, a female individual, and he's seen swerving and um, assaulting that female individual. A bystander contacts the police and say, says, this is what I just saw, and police end up going uh, running the plate going to where the registered uh, where where the plate was registered to the to the address they knock on the door nobody answers they they uh, go into the house and mr stairs's partner who was the victim of the d domestic assault leaves she runs up the stairs she has clear visible injuries and for the purpose of what we're doing here today it doesn't matter really what happened with mr stairs lo and behold they end up finding a, a, a volume of methamphetamine in the basement they arrest him okay and they also arrest her they end up charging her with the drugs with the drugs <laughs> right so i think that speaks volumes about the hesitancy of some victims to come forward and not surprisingly the victim was not at all cooperative with the police in fact she fed them some bullshit about how she sustained those injuries so what do you what do you think about that like what do you make of that in terms of why there is hesitancy for victims of domestic abuse to come forward in this pendulum that we've discussed how things used to be and how they've come to be now yeah that's a that's a hard question i think 
Only somebody in, in a situation like that would really feel the emotion. It might be embarrassment. They're embarrassed to say that this is happening to them, right? That might be a level of hesitancy. But I think what the court has done is the court, and the, mostly the court, has tried to make it as easy as possible. But one of the things... On who? Easy as possible on who? On the victim to testify. Okay. But I think the problem, dude, is, you know, when you make that complaint, you also become a, involved in the system. And, you know, the, when the police come knocking on your door and they have a subpoena to serve you and say, you have to come to court for three days in a row and there's going to be a lawyer that's going to be cross-examining you and you may have sent naked pictures to your boyfriend or girlfriend and he's trying to use them against you now or whatever... All of that is exposed to the court. And, you know, I, I feel like very many people do know that. A lot of people don't. And then they get involved and then they find out that's happening. Yeah. And they're like, oh, shit, I didn't sign up for this. Right. Right. If I knew this was happening, I never would have made this complaint, which is unfortunate. But there's no real way around it because, once again, the most important person in the room during a criminal trial is the accused person. Right. Because they're the ones... They're the person that's going to go to jail, right? It's not the, the victim. So, I mean, you know, these are, it, it's a, that's a really tough question. Hesitancy? Man, I don't know. Would I be hesitant to call the police if I was a victim of domestic assault? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think I'd ever call the police. So, I Especially being a man, too, right? For sure. I want, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I don't, I don't want our listeners, you know, all nine of them to have this perspective that like we're all criminal defense lawyers through and through and all the victims lie and you know, the, the most not. important person in the room is the accused. Let's not forget. I think to put it in context, what you mean is that up to the end of the trial, the most important person in the room and the criminal justice system is the accused. But post conviction, the most important person in the room becomes the victim. Is the lawyer? <laughs> is, is the victim, right? Because they, yeah. they then they have their voices heard. What's the impact that's, uh, yeah, been placed true. on them based and, and and that's all considerations in terms of what sentence the the accused receives. We have talked a lot about the process as it relates to the accused. Let's take a little bit of time and and discuss things from the victim's perspective. So, first and foremost, uh, domestic violence is is something that's obviously very serious, and that's why it's taken so seriously at law and, and why in the context of an offense that, uh, for example, an assault could be domestic or non-domestic, when it is in a domestic context, as we've already discussed, it's aggravating. And there is good reason for that because oftentimes in intimate partner situations, there is uh, a power imbalance, so to speak, in a sense. And to abuse that power, the law recognizes that and that's something that's very important. And that's why we've gone to some lengths in, in discussing uh, what measures should be taken to ensure reporting and there isn't a hesitancy on the part of the victim to report the case. So the last thing we talked about was the uh, hesitancy in a circumstance, for example, under which there is a victim of a domestic abuse and they have done some something wrong themselves, but uh, unrelated to the abuse themselves, but they might be hesitant uh, to come forward. Of course, at the investigation stage, that may even lead to them being charged themselves. But yeah. we want to be very clear with the message that we're putting out there. Uh, it's important. It's crucially important that victims of domestic abuse come forward. It's important that their voices are heard. And from even a criminal defense lawyer's perspective, it's important that they're truthful in even benign elements of their testimony that has nothing to do with the abuse itself because in the eyes of the law and in court it's entirely in the realm of possibility that a victim would lie about one thing that has nothing to do with the assaultive behavior or the uh, accused charges uh, and they lose credibility, unfortunately, to the extent that even when they're telling the truth about the assaultive behavior, they may not be seen as a reliable witness yeah, such that there is a conviction as against the, the aggressors. So we want to kind of drive that point home. And to that end, I know we've discussed it a little bit, but I want to run through the process and procedure that we undertake as criminal defense lawyers 
when we do, and we do on a number of occasions, represent victims of domestic abuse. So I think there's there's a few things or there are a few elements and you let me know if you agree with that, Kabir. There are I mean, few. we both have our own ways of practicing, of course. Yeah. So but pretty similar, but I want to hear, I've never seen you do something like this. So I'm interested to hear so the way you would handle a situation like the this. The way that I would represent a uh, victim of domestic assault is as follows. Number one, I would explain to them the institutions and the avenues that they have already in place without hiring a lawyer. So I would make sure that they know about uh, VWAP, the Victim Witness Assistance Program, mm -hmm. that they know that they, they are entitled to call, contact the OIC or the officer in charge to see, to get information. What's going on with the case? What Was my wife or husband or whatever released on certain conditions, et cetera, just to get information. And then they're entitled to have their voices heard throughout the entire process. Then I would ask them effectively what do they want? Forget about the legalese, forget about the system in and of itself. What is it that you want to happen here? And then I would work backwards in that way. So I would make sure that they understand the consequences of lying. If they, for example, came forward and said, I lied to the police, this didn't happen, even if the motive is to just stop their domestic partner from getting in trouble, then they themselves can be charged. And that's yeah. not a necessary step that they need to take in order to advocate for the position. Exactly. That they want. Yeah. Exactly. That's More often than it. not, what I do is I review their statement to police in, an, in whichever way it came, video, written, whatever. And then I, I run things by them and I try and I try to, with, with, with in this particular part of my work, especially, I try to humanize the process. Yeah. You know, what happened? Was it, were you guys frustrated over your finances? Were you stressed because you were sleep deprived because your kid was awake for two nights? You know, all of these things matter so that you can humanize the process. And then I help them draft an affidavit, which is a, a, an out of court sworn statement. That outlines these things in a way that I, th I would think would best help the situation. And more often than not, contrary to popular belief, I'm not advocating for them to say, shit didn't happen. I didn't do this. I didn't say this to the police. I'm not doing that. Of course, I would never do that either. Invariably, what I always end off with is this is a mistake that happened. I now understand the resources that are available to me and I've equipped myself with those resources such that if something else similar were to happen, I know exactly what I can do. I can contact the police. I have VWAP, etc. And that I believe currently I don't fear for my safety if that is in fact the case. I want the support system that I had with my partner. I want to rekindle our relationship and try and move forward to this. And I believe we are best served dealing with this situation on our own without court intervention. Yes. And, you know, actually, you're not that different from the way I, I guess maybe good lawyers all do their work the same way. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But I also do the same thing. I think the most important thing is to listen. Yeah. Right. When somebody comes in front of me in a situation like this, that are overwhelmed, like for a, a, a victim of a domestic assault to take the extreme step of me even meeting with a lawyer mm -hmm. and then hiring a lawyer means that they're overwhelmed, right. that they have no idea what's going on. Nobody's listening to them. They have no support mm -hmm. or not adequate support. Maybe not no support, but maybe not support that the support that they need. So. When I'm there, I make sure I listen to what they have to say, right? And, you know, I will always advocate. You know, one of the options that I, one of the things that I advise a lot of my um, victim clients is that, you know, you can suggest to the Crown Attorney that this person take counseling if that's what you think is necessary. Right. If you think this person has an anger issue, you think this person has an alcohol issue, and you want them to get help, well, me as a... Uh, a representative of the victim can advise the court and the crown that this is one of the things that she or he wants. 
Right. Right. They want their partner to uh, engage in this counseling because, you know, surprise, surprisingly, counseling does work. 100%. Right. You begin to realize and understand things about yourself and the actions that you take. And it can make a huge difference in someone's life. And and time and time again, I've said that to uh, my clients who are the accused in domestic uh, situations is that counseling is good. It's a good thing. It's not where you just go and sit down and someone bashes you over the head and just says what a piece of shit you are. That's not how that works. And yeah. the example that I give them is that without a shred of shame, I would benefit from from that counseling myself, right? Because it's all about coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. How, how can you diffuse anger? How can you... Uh, exit the situation so that y- things don't escalate, you know, the, and it's important. Yeah. And so I always advocate uh, for that, not just by saying, you know, telling a victim that I'm representing, this is what you can request, but also encouraging the client to do that. Yeah, of course. More often than not, do it up front. Don't wait until somebody asks you to do it, right? Just get it done, get started so that I can go in front of a judge and say, look, he did it on his own. Nobody forced him. Nobody asked him before he was even asked to do any of this. He just went ahead and did it. And so, yeah, I think um, we've covered quite a bit of topics here. We've answered a lot of our most common questions. We hope that this podcast has been informative for all of our listeners. And, you know, um, oftentimes, like, you know, we don't like to work for free. But if, you know, victims of um, domestic assault at least call me, I'll always take some time to chat with them and can't give them advice unless I'm, I'm their lawyer. But I'm always able to, to give them information. Yeah, and right? I, I do the same. So, you know, like I never want to, like, you know, a lot of it, it, it's a huge problem in our country. It happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Obviously, everyone needs a defense. But we're not ignorant to the fact that this shit really happens too, right? right? So anyone who's in a situation like that, I try to help however I can. Seen as the same way. If you do have any concerns, feel free to send us a shout or give us a I don't know, call or whatever. For sure. And there's obviously a reason why Parliament has enacted certain legislation to ensure that victims of crime uh, or victims of domestic violence come forward and to give them the resources that they need in, in order to do that so they don't they don't get doubly victimized or ostracized uh, within the system so yeah. to that end of course i do the same thing while i can't you know provide uh, advice unless there's a solicitor client relationship established i always take the time to at the very least provide information so that they know what's available for them out yeah. there and to that end kabir if someone wants to shoot us a a question, how could they find us? You can find us on Instagram at Titan LLP. We have a website, www.titanllp.com. Go on our website. You can get our numbers. My cell phone number's on there. Our office number's on there. Same. And, or you, you can know. shoot us an email at info at titanllp.com. Yeah. And uh, that's a wrap. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Peace.